Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Legendary is pretty much an understatement when describing former Beatle Paul McCartney. Music may be his claim to fame, but he's also found another passion over the years, photography. He met up with Anthony Mason in London to discuss the art of the still image. This picture was when we were arriving at, uh, I think it was the Deauville Hotel yeah. in Miami. I think your quote in the book was, I can almost hear her scream. Yeah, you can. The cop's got to restrain her, you know. Well, I also love the cop in the foreground who just sort of looks yeah. puzzled by everything. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I like the architecture so of I. that hotel. So do I. I actually hotel. love it. But, you know, as we were saying before, that was had to be taken really quickly. Yeah. She had to snap that. Yeah. But you have to have an eye to take that. It's my left one. <laughs> Later in the show, Paul McCartney on capturing the beauty of the everyday in his photos. Um, you also, you took a lot of pictures from cars, from the train, of just ordinary folks on the street. What drew you to that? Well, um, I was attracted to, still am, to the working class, what you guys call blue collars. Um, we don't call it that over here. Um, so I was always wondering, people say he's blue collar. I go, what, he's got a nice shirt? He said, no, no, it's a... Anyway, so we call it the working class and um, I'm from the working class and I'm like really proud. There's a lot of people from my family who are very smart, you know? Mm. And I say to people, never underestimate the working class. There's a lot of very smart people out there. Plus, Jim Axelrod met a woman on a mission to finish a lifelong bucket list, but it's not her own. It's her late father's. Sort what she's love. sifted That's through the last six years is a list of all those things Mick Carney Jesus set out to right. do. 60 There's items he wrote down when he was 29. He'd only had a chance to try six when he was killed. What do you think the value of writing a bucket list is? You know, not only are you writing down your intentions for your life, but you're also committing to showing the world who you are authentically. So even if you don't finish it, maybe your kids find it someday and then they know what you cared about and that matters. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Many of us can recognize Paul McCartney from those indelible images from the height of Beatlemania back in the 60s. But it turns out McCartney was documenting that experience from his own point of view with his own camera. Anthony Mason learned more about the photographs that he took on the Beatles' 1964 American tour. Paul McCartney used his Pentax camera the same way he used his guitar, with total freedom. Taking photographs, I'd be just looking for a shot. Yeah. And so I'd aim the camera and just sort of see where I liked it, you know, oh, that's it. Yeah. And invariably, you pretty much take one picture. 3,000 screaming teenagers are at New York's Kennedy Airport to greet, you guessed it, the Beatles. Early in 1964, the 21-year-old took his new camera on perhaps the most momentous musical journey of the 20th century. The Beatles' invasion of America. I think we were moving fast. Yeah. So you just learned to take pictures quickly. Hundreds of his photographs from that trip were recently rediscovered in McCartney's archive. It was really nice. Number one, because I thought they were lost. The images, collected in the new book, 1964, Eyes of the Storm, will be on view at the National Portrait Gallery in London. This picture was when we were arriving at, uh, I think it was the Deauville Hotel yeah. in Miami. I think your quote in the book was, I can almost hear her scream. Yeah, you can. The cop's got to restrain her, you know. Well, I also love the cop in the foreground who just sort of looks yeah. puzzled by everything. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I like the architecture so do of I. that I hotel. Love but, you know, as we were saying before, that was had to be taken really quickly. Yeah. She had to snap that. Yeah. But you have to have an eye to take that. It's my left one. <laughs> the Beatles had started their trip in Paris. And uh, it was in Paris that we got the telegram. Congratulations, boys, number one in the US charts. And you had said you won't go to America yeah. unless you have a number one. I know. 
And, you know, that was pretty spunky to kind of think that. Yeah. But I'd seen quite a few of our major stars yeah. go to the States and we're going, well, he's going to leave us now. He'll, yeah. he'll be fam famous over there. And, but then they'd come back and they weren't famous. So I said, well, if we go over there, you know, this, I really don't want to come back with our tail between our legs. In America... Show, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles! That's they played the Ed Sullivan Show. 73 million people would tune in. McCartney calls it the moment all hell breaks loose. To look at those pictures, it's kind of you looking at the world, looking at you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you seemed, you seemed very comfortable with it. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've got to think about it. We're kids from Liverpool. Yeah. And we're trying to get famous. And it's not easy. And we were like stars in America. And people loved us. So we loved it. And having that number one was really the secret. Yeah. Because if the journalists, you know, New York journalists, hey, Bill. Hey, hey, Peter, what are you doing? Why are you? And we sort of say, say why, are you, why, are you, why are you here? Why are you, you know, whatever. We said, we're number one in your country. <laughs> Bingo. McCartney captured the commotion on the streets around New York's Plaza Hotel and the crowd that chased them when they snuck out the side door. There was one reporter who said you were like prisoners with room service. Yeah, that was kind of true. But we like room service. <laughs> You know, we'd never had it before. From New York, the Beatles traveled by train to Washington, D.C. McCartney's camera took the ride, too. Is this from the train, too? Yeah, they're pretty much all on the train or from the train. But I love this guy. He's, like, from where I'm from. He looked great. He's got his hand up like... He's got a little smile, too, yeah, I think. Yeah, a little smile, yeah. That's a great moment. It's nice. It's a great memory, you know, for me. So many of McCartney's pictures were taken on the move. You shot that from your car. Yeah, the, uh, the policeman in Miami, uh, he just pulled right up next to me. Mm -hmm. And that was basically what I saw. Mm -hmm. And we'd never seen policemen with guns. Um, we just didn't have that in England. But in Miami, McCartney broke out the color film. For us, it was like going on holiday. The Fab Four even had a few days off. There's some great shots of all of you with like, look like Terry Goth's jackets. Yeah, the hotel supplied them. You know, you normally get like a, a robe. Yeah. But this place, because it was Miami, yeah. had these little cool little short things and hats. We lived in them for days. Even Brian, our manager, we thought they were really cool items of clothing. He caught George relaxing with an anonymous admirer. In that picture, yeah. I don't think I was trying to protect her identity. <laughs> I love her bathing costume. Yeah, it's a great shot. It's so great. Yeah. And, you know, there's George. Like, I, I keep saying, you know, living the life. Yeah. He's got a drink, which is probably a Scotch and Coke. He's got a tan, a girl in the yellow bikini. Yeah. From lads from Liverpool, that was exceptionally wonderful. <laughs> from their triumphant appearances in the United States. The band went back home to England in late February. By early April, the Beatles had the top five songs on the U.S. charts. McCartney writes, we spent the months and years after holding on for dear life. Did you remember all of these when you saw them? Kind of. It was a very memorable period. Oh, you I'm know, sure. Yeah. But there was so much going on, I'm amazed you could process it and keep it all. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> McCartney's not only looking back at photos of his past, but he announced to the BBC that this fall he'll be releasing what he says is the last Beatles record, a John Lennon demo tape that McCartney's remixing using the latest artificial intelligence technology. The music, like Paul McCartney's pictures, all part of the Beatles' enduring legacy. So, you know, for me, it's like a little slice of American history. Yeah. And it's my history, it's that it's the Beatles' history. So um, it was great to rediscover these pictures.
Up next, an exclusive excerpt from our chat with Paul McCartney. Something you'll only see right here on CBS News Streaming. Stay with us. Come on in. And so fans would come in. As promised, here's more from Anthony Mason's sit-down with Paul McCartney about the photos that he took on the Beatles' 1964 U.S. tour. Right before this trip, you just got a camera? Yeah. Oh, well, I had a, an old uh, box brownie. And our family had one of those to take holiday snapshots. Yeah, but I got a kind of professional camera just before this trip, yeah. Yeah. These pictures have obviously been, were they sort of, tucked away somewhere for all these years? Yeah, um, over the years, anything I can't find, I assume it's been lost or stolen. Because in the 60s, you used to leave your doors open. Uh, yeah, it's all very, hey man, yeah. come on in. And so fans would come in the house mm -hmm. and a lot of stuff went missing. So I just kind of assumed it had all gone. But I was then, uh, dealing with my photo archivist yeah. of my office, who's a girl called Sarah Brown, yeah. and she was doing Linda's exhibitions, my first wife, Linda. So we were talking about that, and I said, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm sure I've got some black and white pictures I took in the 60s. She said, yeah, we've got them. They're in the archive. I said, ooh, let's have a look. So she, she got them out, and there were way more than I thought. I thought we might find about it. 10 little old prints. Yeah. It was quite an expansive collection. So we started looking at them, talking about them. Yeah. So it was amazing to see them there uh, in good shape. You know, they, they weren't all just wrecked or... So it was great to see them. And just the nostalgia mm -hmm. and seeing us when we were kids. I mean, I look at my grandkids now, that's the sort of age of my eldest ones. That's the age we were then. So we just, um, it was lovely just to remember, oh my God, we went to America and we looked like that. And we were so keen. We do anything the photographers asked us. <laughs> uh, you know, so it brought back the period for me. Um, and of course with John and George uh, not being here anymore, it was a great memory to have. Uh, you know, it's snapshots of loved ones. You're pretty good with a camera. Not bad, <laughs> not bad. Um, you also, you took a lot of pictures from cars, from the train, of just ordinary folks on the street. What drew you to that? Well, um, I was attracted to, still am, to the working class, what you guys call blue collars. Um, we don't call it that over here. Um, so I was always wondering, people say he's blue collar, I go, what? He's got a nice shirt. He said, no, no, it's... A... Anyway, so we call it the working class, and um, I'm from the working class, and I'm, like, really proud. There's a lot of the people from my family were very smart, you know. Mm -hmm. and I say to people, never underestimate the working class. There's a lot of very smart people out there. So, yeah, I like, I like that, and uh, I'd grown up with these kind of people. So if ever I saw one of them sweeping up on a train station, mm -hmm. I'd take his pictures, uh, airport workers. And you know, they would get in the spirit of it and they'd goof back, you know. <laughs> they'd do his stuff, you know. <laughs> so they were good subjects. Yeah. But it was, I, I like working people. Some of the shots are a little blurry, but that sort of adds to the yeah. feeling of them. I think we moved so fast, you didn't always have time like a professional to sort of really be careful about yeah. uh, focusing up. Um, but I kind of like them. Yeah. Um, they, they have a sort of rom more romantic quality when they're like soft focus. Uh, but when, when we started the exhibition, I was saying, you know, oh, I don't think we can use them. But the girls uh, working, the girls from MPG and my uh, archivist, they said, no, 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 there's a cert this, it's got a certain something. And then, of course, I remembered Margaret Cameron her, whose photos were often soft focus. So, yeah, so I like them now. Your brother was a pretty avid photographer. That still is, yeah. yeah. That shot he took of you with the newspaper in the beginning is great. Yeah. On the chair. Yeah, he took some great pictures because when we came back from Germany, we'd met uh, a couple of professional photographers with a girl called Astrid 
Kirshner. So we were photographed by her and she had like a Hasselblad, which to us was very exotic. So I bought him one and it started his photographic career. And so he took a lot of shots of me around the house. And, and he's, a, he's a professional photographer now. Did he influence you at all? Um, <laughs> okay. I'm not giving him that. <laughs> He's my brother, <laughs> and he's younger. <laughs> okay. Come on. Up next, finishing the bucket list of a life cut short. Welcome back. Bucket lists, those goals people hope to achieve during their lifetimes, can look a little different for each person. Jim Axelrod met a woman who completed the items left on her late father's bucket list, and while doing so, found some unexpected meaning in her own life. In her small apartment in Montclair, New Jersey, oh, wow. Laura Carney's dreams are coming true. It's so cool to finally hold it in my hands. I mean, Just like her father always knew they would, even if unaware of exactly the role he'd play. Laura Carney, my father's list, how living my dad's dreams set me free. Laura's first book was yeah, just published, so weird. a like dream creation. born of a nightmare 20 so years ago. And I remember thinking how angry I was that he didn't finish his life, you know, that he didn't get to do all the things he set out to do. Mick Carney was killed in a car crash at the age of 54. Was he a good dad? Yeah, oh, the best. A sensitive, sentimental, and, like so many of our fathers, complicated man. Loving. You're the you best get, thing I've ever done. You're the best thing I've ever done. That's what he said all the time. But he also left her a lot to sift through. Like when he split from her mom, when Laura was just a girl. When he left, when you were six, was there something you had to overcome? Oh, of course. Of course. I, I believed he abandoned us for a long time. So weird, his handwriting, right? It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy to read. <laughs> what she's sifted through the last six years is a list of all those things Mick Carney set out to do. 60 items he wrote down when he was 29. He'd only had a chance to try six when he was killed. What do you think the value of writing a bucket list is? You know, not only are you writing down your intentions for your life, but you're also committing to showing the world who you are authentically. So even if you don't finish it, maybe your kids find it someday and then they know what you cared about and that matters. Things I would like to do in my lifetime. When her brother found the list in 2016. I couldn't help but notice talk with the president right away. Talk to a president, correspond with the Pope, run 10 miles. Swim the width of a river, surf in the Pacific Ocean. She was intimidated. Ocean. And then I just got this image in the back of my mind of my dad's face smiling and nodding. That never happened before. So that was the thing that really made me feel like, oh, I need to do this. But when she and her husband, Stephen, headed to Georgia and Jimmy Carter's Sunday service. If you want a photograph, you can stay. Daunted, turned to inspired. So what happened? I said, uh, President Carter, my father wrote down that he wanted to meet you on his bucket list and I'm checking that off for him today. And he said, oh, very good. This was the most impossible list item, and, I, and we did it. And I think everything changed after that, because if I could do the most impossible one, then what was to stop me from doing the rest? Ever since, she's been checking them off. Why are there so Record many five songs. Songs about rainbows. Sailed by herself. All right, here we go. Skydive. Was any part of you, as you would read this, be like, come on, Dad. Like, yeah. <laughs> but when I would be in the middle of doing them, I just had this feeling that my dad wouldn't let me fail. Maybe the most challenging for this reluctant driver was hopping behind the wheel of a Corvette. I took it slow, then I knew it was the same highway where my dad's crash had happened. But the challenge was where the healing was. I felt like I now could associate a new memory with driving. And the car phobia went away. Then all of a sudden I was taking long trips and driving myself. I changed the narrative. My dad and I weren't victims of something anymore. No, they weren't. With the help of her long gone dad, Laura 
was learning to rethink her approach to life. But underpinning this entire list is do things to enjoy doing them. That's right, which Not I wasn't the, doing. Your dad was teaching you through this list that you derive pleasure from the doing, not how well you do it, from the doing of it. It opened my heart, which had been shut down. Chapter 12, own a black tux. So now Laura Carney is sharing what she learned by completing the list, how she made her connection to her father's memory 54 times tighter and found peace in the process. So I'm not stuck in that, that day when he died anymore. Now I'm living in the present and I'm going and doing all these incredibly fun things. Everybody has that possibility to still have that connection because even though people die, love is something that never dies. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here next time on Here Comes the Sun.